I think those negotiations with the unions are present. Okay. Are we going to be discussing alliances today, though, that are going to be, that are already prioritised by the department for review? Absolutely. Yes. So we will be getting into those details. Then. Yes, absolutely. But you no, no difficult, no, sorry, there's no difficulty talking through the details sure. of any alliance. But what we just want to be careful about is the negotiating strategy with the unions that we're going to be entering into. Okay. So we're, we've just commenced that. We, we've informed some of the unions this week that we're commencing that. And we're starting that process. And we're having discussions with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform about the prioritisation of which alliances we can seek. Some of them are not just in the education sector. Some of these alliances, as you'll be aware, that have common elements across a number of other departments. So we have to have a, a joined up approach with the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and indeed other departments in advancing our negotiating approaches with the unions. Okay. And when we talk about those 80 alliances, we're talking about current beneficiaries. Sure. And so would it be fair to say that some of the alliances that were initially identified as not being um, available to new entrants are now on the table for current beneficiaries? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and the, sorry, just to, just to confirm that, it's, it's the, the hope to, is to save 16 million from 80 allowances. We, we've identified that that is the cost. We'll enter into negotiations about that. We haven't identified a cost savings target. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, but and, and then, sorry, just a uh, final question on that, on that paragraph. In terms of the process, that process has begun. And, I mean, this... February, not deadline, but February has been mentioned before as being the time of, of next year that we hope some part of that process to have concluded in relation to the 88 allowances. So are we hoping to see something then with the priority areas at least by February of next year? Mr. Burke, my lawyer. Yes, I, I think the, the, just to, to, to go back over, over the 88, the, the logic of the situation, I think, is this, that uh, case, uh, allowances for which a uh, prospective case for their retention in the hands of new beneficiaries was not advanced. Logically, there is a question mark then in relation to those allowances in the hands of current beneficiaries. And that, in a sense, is the logic, I think, of the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform position on this. But there's a, there's a reality as well with that scale of allowances. Essentially, we'll have to have uh, a prioritization of the, the, the time scaling and, and the, the, the negotiation of those. And, and we, we would envisage starting that process in the very near future with a focused number of such allowances and we haven't made a final call on those yet and hopefully bringing that element and I'm not underestimating its difficulty let me be very clear on that but the objective would be that in relation to that element that we commence in the very near future achieving some element of finality on that by the, by, 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 by the, Febr by the February deadline. And so are we asking then, the, I mean, is it the case then that the department must come back with, if you like, new business cases? If you look at the business cases for a lot of the alliances that were initially submitted, they, they begin by saying, well, no, we regard this as core pay and under core park agreement, so therefore, we, you know, we, we're not going to discuss it, if you like, for current beneficiaries. We're going to talk about it for new entrants, and then decisions were made on those. So are we talking about then, not a new process, but them coming back with, uh, you know, new terms, I suppose, in which to make the case? No, no I, I think what, what the department would have done, done in, in, in the review of allowances, there were 80, 88 of them. And we said, well, we, we, we accept that there is not a case for those to be renewed in the future. And there's a range of examples there, Gale Tuck, Island allowance, and so on and so on. Where, where circumstances that maybe might have been present when they first came into being, in our judgment, no longer obtained. There were a range of other allowances where we said, well, these are effectively part of core pay. And by that simply, I, I think, if I might define what I mean by part of core pay, I think we would have taken a general view that if an allowance is generic, in a sense it's paid to everyone within a grade, it is much more likely to be categorisable as a part of core pay in that type of situation. Whereas if an allowance is paid to a subset of people for particular duties and so on, then that's not as, cl as clearly part of core pay. So, so we divide our, our, our business cases divided into those we, we, we argued should legitimately be retained, those that should not be retained in the future. The exercise now underway is in relation to that second category, for which there was a wasn't a case prospectively, uh, we, we, we are now commencing a process of seeking to negotiate uh, their removal from current beneficiaries. And you mentioned, sorry, you mentioned the Gale Talk Alliance and the Island Alliance. 
um, as two, I mean, they've been single out actually, the Minister mentioned those as, as, as ones we were looking at. There's also an Irish language allowance. Is that being looked at as well? Correct. That's, that's another one for which the uh, business case prospectively uh, did not favour its continuation. It's not, it's not been paid to new entrants. New entrants, yeah. but we are now looking to see if existing beneficiaries will be able to accept that allowance. And that allowance is worth how much? Do we know is that? I mean, I'm sure, I know we've got a lot of spreadsheets and business spaces. It'll just be 3.1 million. Thank you. Just then to, I mean, we've got um, some correspondence in and uh, appendices to the correspondence. Um, and just a couple of general questions before going to specific allowances. In Appendix A, you give uh, examples of teachers and allowances that they might receive. Um, and just for my own clarity, so you've got the basic salary, then you add on the total value of allowances, and you have the total gross salary. And tax is then paid on the total gross. Yeah, because there's been some misinformation, I think, about that in the media. And then also then, it's the gross salary that's used in terms of calculating the pension. Thank you. Just to answer the question about the Teaching Through Irish Alliance, the Teaching Through Irish Alliance is €1,583 and the Island Alliance is 1842 and the Gaeltacht is 3063 Okay, that's the independent, or that's the, the, the value of the alliance itself. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, that's been identified because it's a subset and it's not generic across a grade. Right. And we have the numbers in receipt of each of those in, in the spreadsheets. Um, then if we look at Appendix B, we have the number of allowances held by teachers um, in a table. And so um, 460 primary teachers not getting any allowances, for example. Um, but then you have the numbers in receipt of one allowance, primary 17,048 people, secondary 15,446, and then total number being 32,494. Um, but at the bottom of that table, it says, in addition to the above, almost 95% of teachers receive the supervision and substitution payment. So in, in effect, when I look at this table, that allowance isn't calculated into it. So is that correct? Because it's in addition to the above. We, we, we got this, this information from our payroll system, but the, the S and S element couldn't be integrated with the other elements in providing the information. So. We're, we know that 95% of teachers get the S and S allowance, so it can be estimated that in most cases, 95% uh, under each of the groups are in receipt of the S and S allowance. Okay. So when it has a primary teacher there, for example, number of allowances one, primary teachers 17,048. In fact, in, in effect, it's two allowances. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the figure would largely remain the same because it's 95% of that figure. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And then that would apply across the table. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, just then in relation to the, the supervision and substitution payment, um, that's worth, is it 116 million? 118 million. 118 million on an annual basis. Now that's not been continued for new entrants, is that correct? No, it's been, ex it's been extended for new entrants. So, so it is being continued for new entrants? It's been continued for new entrants, yeah. Okay. New entrants are, are to, to do more hours to receive the allowance. And that, that allowance is going to teachers in primary and secondary schools, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, I, if you break down as to what that allowance is actually for. Yeah. I saw previously a figure that, say, 50 million is spent annually to primary schools for yard supervision. Is that included in this? Is that what yeah. comes under substitution and supervision? Yeah. Maybe, maybe it might be useful to give a bit of background about, about the SNS allowance. It arose from the, the lengthy industrial relations dispute which from 2000 to 2002 and prior to that uh, SNS had been undertaken on a, on a kind of a grace and favour basis by teachers but at second level in particular teachers withdrew that grace and favour basis and we had to then move into the position of actually giving schools money to employ uh, supervisors uh, for, for, for pupils outside of classes. And arising from that, we entered into detailed discussions with, with the unions and agreed a scheme uh, whereby they would take responsibility for, they would provide 37 hours supervision and substitution in return for a, for a payment. And if teachers didn't opt into that scheme, and where teachers don't opt into that scheme, we give the schools a grant to employ supervisors for, for every teacher not, not opting into the scheme. So that's, that's the basis for it. It applies in a different way. In, in, in primary and post-primary because of the nature of the primary school 
day involves teachers effectively with full class contact time, whereas at post-primary it's 22 hours typically of, of class contact time. So the supervision could be yard supervision before or after school, but also could be supervising classes where, where the teacher is where the teacher isn't isn't available. It was actually subject to a CNAG review uh, in relation to the 2007-8 school year. The report was published in 2009, and there was it was considered here by that committee in in some detail at the time. Also, in the Crow Park agreement, as part of the agreement with teachers, we increased the amount of hours at second level that teachers would make themselves opt to be available, so that teachers would opt to be available for an increased number of hours. They would, the, the way it works is that they agree with the principal their availability for a number of periods, class periods a week, but we increased the potential availability so the principals would have a better option in terms of getting teachers to, to supervise under the SNS scheme. When it initially came in, um 2002 was it? Um, when it came in then it was teachers would voluntarily sign up to be available for an extra 37 hours in a year to get the allowance and for that then they would make themselves available if it was in a primary school to say supervise the yard on a given day during their lunch break um, and in a secondary school a teacher would say if there was a free class because a teacher was absent another teacher would come in and sit and watch over them. Or at, or, or, or at lunchtime as well, lunchtime and break time. They have the yeah, supervision right, yeah, in secondary yeah, schools. Yeah. Okay. But I'm just curious as to what changed, though, um, around that time, where for many number of years it was seen as the job of the teacher, um, should a colleague be sick, to go in and sit and supervise a class, uh, or supervise that class in the library, or wherever, however it might happen in the school, or whereby a teacher would take one lunch break, say, every three weeks, depending on the number of teachers. Uh, to supervise the ER duty. What, what was the change in circumstances that led them to think that this was no longer part of the job? I think the unions, the teacher unions probably up until indeed 2000, 2002 would always have maintained, I mean one might argue the rights and wrongs of this view, as indeed I would probably, but they would always have maintained that uh, substitution and supervision work was not part of the core contract and that it was essentially given on a, as they would have described it, race and favour basis. And that came to a crunch point in the fact, in, in, in a particularly bitter, and I think many people will remember it, industrial dispute back in the early 2000s. Uh, and the effect of, of, of that was industrial action, which saw them actually withdrawing from that duty. And the state then was obliged essentially to bring in outside people uh, to, 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 to undertake that supervision work. There was a real challenge at the time to government pay policy, that, that was the reality. And uh, ultimately, uh, the negotiated settlement here uh, was, was one where a, a, an allowance was put in place for substitution and supervision work. Uh, and that allowance, while it, while it was technically optional for a teacher as to whether they would undertake to do the work and get the allowance, the vast majority of teachers bought into that. It, it had the benefit, I suppose, from the state's point of view and the system's point of view in uh, providing probably a better substitution and supervision service that was no longer required, reliant on the principal seeking to get a teacher uh, to, to, to do something almost on a voluntary basis. There, there was now a greater certainty, but undoubtedly there was a cost attaching to it as well. And I mean, because we're talking about, about 41,500 teachers each signing up for 37 hours additional work, roughly one hour a week per teacher. So, I mean, is that work actually being called in? Because the CNAG queried whether or not those hours are actually being used. Yes, following the CNAG report, uh, and as part of the um, uh, Crow Park Agreement in its init initial negotiation, uh, we extended the allowable number of periods per week for which, teacher, uh, for, for which teachers could be called from two to three. And the effect of that now is to make it significantly more likely that that 37 hours would be called in in full. And um, school, school budgets in reality for alternative substitution uh, have been restricted as well. So we would be more optimistic about that now. Does that mean that we've got a big problem with teachers not turning up for work or not being available for work? These teachers are supervising and substituting for other teachers who aren't there. And it's, if you're taking, if they are going to be turning up for the full, or using the full 37 hours a year, you know, by the 41,500 teachers, it's a lot of hours of absenteeism. 
I think there's two dimensions to it. Um, and I, we can talk perhaps separately about the teacher sick leave situation. I'm not sure we have the figures in front of us at the moment, but they're not, in fact, to, to, to be fair, and from my recollection, they're not out of out of kilter in any significant way with 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 with, with um, absentee rates or sick leave rates elsewhere in, in 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 the sector. But there are two dimensions to to this allowance. There's the provision of substitution, uh, and there's also the supervision dimension. And the supervision dimension is, is, you know, arises for a multiplicity of reasons. You've got the preschool situation, you've got the, 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 um, the, the lunch break situation and so on, where supervision is, is, is required. Uh, the substitution, then, it, it doesn't take, a, a, I mean, the, the reality here is that even, even if you have a teacher who's delayed in the morning, uh, you know, who, you know, whatever the, the, the circumstances are, comes in at 10 o'clock rather than 9, there's a call in that type of situation uh, on, 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 on the substitution end of things. Somebody has to go in and, t and essentially take that class. But we also give money to schools to pay for people to come in <coughs> to cover teachers not being in the school as well. In, in, certain, in, in certain circumstances, the first, I think it's the first day of, on, of uncertified sick leave isn't covered, and we've also reduced um, in, in where, where there were higher levels of permissions for uncertified leave days, the reductions were made down to a maximum of seven per year. So there have been a number of different changes which have impacted on, on teacher absences. The, the substitution arrangements are permitted for only particular absences, such as certified leave, maternity leave. I think there's another aspect which is different in the teaching profession than other professions, and that is that if, if a civil servant is absent from their job, they, they don't actually have to supervise and manage a class, so they're, they're, there's a need for somebody to be physically present when a teacher isn't there, which doesn't apply in other areas of the public sector. I'm not saying that other areas of the public sector, their work isn't important. It's just that it's possible for a section, uh, say in a civil service department, to split the work up for a day, but for a, for a teaching job, somebody needs to be there for a class or else the class has to be split up. And to be fair to schools, where we don't provide substitution, the classes sometimes are split up, and that's one of the strategies they use to manage it. But we don't want them to be doing that only, and we only want them to be doing that in very limited circumstances. It's not really comparable, though, because a teacher's job is supervision. So it's not unusual for a teacher to have to sit in front of a class for a 45 minute period. It's no, not what I'm not saying, I'm just saying if, if the teacher isn't there for whatever reason, there's a need for somebody else to be there. Whereas in the civil service, you don't have to replace somebody on a sick leave day. Whereas in. Someone has to do their work. Or yes. Cover their work, yeah, or somebody the work has to be done. They're on a phone yeah. or they're working on a project. Yeah. Someone else has to step in. Uh, and in most workplaces, I think people do step in. Uh, you know, I, I, if I looked at someone, say, in the private sector, and they were told that you know, every week you might have to step into someone else's shoes for an hour, the first thing you'd probably say is, okay, that's, that's what I've got to do. That's part of the job. The second thing I'd ask, though, is where's that person? I don't have an issue with that. Or if I was told that once every two weeks I might have to work through lunch because we were doing something in particular. You would accept that as part of the job. That's why I'm here. So in the primary school, the teacher of sixth class can't step in to manage fourth class because they're already managing sixth class. The only thing that they can do is take the fourth class pupils into their room if there's room in the room, or else the teachers of four, the kids in fourth class have to get split up across the various different classes. So I, we agree with your. I mean, don't disagree with your overall. Point. I mean, how are they getting extra hours then? If the teachers in sixth class. No, they don't. don't. I'm just saying class. that in a primary school you need a substitute teacher in to teach the fourth class if the teacher isn't available for work. Whereas the, the other teachers can't just step in and cover because they're already teaching classes. Okay, but so in, in primary schools we're, we're paying people to come in from outside to supervise those classes in most cases? We're paying substitute t t teachers to come in, not, not just to supervise, to actually teach them. Now on the first day of, I think it's the first day of uncertified sick leave, we don't pay for that but as part of... primary school teachers though getting this allowance for signing up to the extra 37 hours in the world. And they do it in supervision terms, there's no... So they're doing that for your duty? So that they sign up for supervision. For the, uh, yeah, supervision. Yeah, yeah. And then, so effectively, they can't supervise the class. No, the it's, not part, it's not part of, it's not part of the, the super... That doesn't include substitution for other teachers because they can't. Primary school, it's, it's supervision and in, in effect, in the, then we're talking about yeah. your duty. Yeah. During the lunch break. Yeah. And, and before and after school and, and at, at, the, at the break, early in the morning. Okay, so just yeah. to cover the breaks, to go into the yard, to supervise the children, to make sure everything's okay. Obviously yeah. someone has to do that. Yeah. Um, but before 2000, 
I mean, all the way up until 2000, that was seen as part of the job, that you would do that once a week, once every two weeks. I, mean, I, I remember when I was in school myself, the teacher would be out in the yard with her, a cup of coffee and a sandwich, and, you know, the teacher would do it on a rotation basis. And that's how it yeah, works. That, that, that's, although they would have argued that they were doing it, as, as Mr. Burke said, on a grace and favour basis. And then we had this major, and then we had responsibilities to teach yeah, school. And then we had the, the major industrial relations dispute, and arising from that, the agreement was entered into. Okay, um, but I mean, in terms of the teachers' own salaries, then, um, and them increasing over time as, as they have, and it's important that we pay teachers enough because we want good people in the profession, of course. Would that not have been seen as then coming into the salary that you would have made that? Uh, as the, uh, um, you'd accept that into the salary at that stage and say, okay, we're now, I suppose, expanding your contract and we're not going to do this as a grace of favour approach. It's part of your core responsibilities. It's now part of your core pay. If, in answering that, perhaps, and it's, 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 it's the hindsight one, really, probably, looking back to 2000, the context there was one of the teacher unions asked you, I think, we're seeking actually a 30%, it's inconceivable in today's terms, but a 30% increase in pay. And there was a very, very significant dispute around that. And there was a real concern on the part of government that whatever, if anything was conceded, in fact, because the, you know, we were in the context at the time of a general pay settlement, so if anything over and above that pay settlement were conceded, it would effectively unravel uh, the, 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 the government pay policy at the time. So I, I would venture to say that whatever was conceded at the time it would not have been tactically prudent to have conceded a salary increase. And I think that was probably the genesis of the ultimate settlement here, travelling by way of allowance. So now we're looking back at all of these things. Yeah, and we're, and we're trying to find greater flexibility in the workplace, and we're trying to find cost savings. I mean, we heard this morning that the education budget, 80% of it, is locked into pay. And we can't look at it in the cuts that we're trying to make. Isn't this an accession that you would make, I mean, potentially saving over 100 million, to say, well, look, before 2002, so 10 years ago, up until that point, this was not considered that you would have to be paid extra to do this. It was a part of your responsibility in the role as a teacher. And we're going to look at that again because we feel that it's covered as part of your salary. There are other allowances, etc. in the system. As we see, most teachers are getting, you know, some form of allowance in the matrix that you provided in Appendix B. Um, and you say that to them now and go, look, this is the situation that we're in. We have to go back to where we were 10 years ago. But we've decided not to pursue that. Okay. On, on the overall point, there's obviously a very high percentage of the education budget is pay. That doesn't mean that the pay budget can't be reduced because we can change teacher allocations and not replace teachers who retire. So just because we have a pay budget of, or of a certain percentage doesn't mean there can't be reductions in, in the pay budget without touching pay rates. It's a, an important overall point in terms of looking. And if you look at the sorts of measures that have been introduced in recent years, they have, as well as the government measures that are related to pension, related deductions and pay, there have also been teacher or other education personnel allocation decisions made which have resulted in reduced numbers working in the education sector. So that's just, just on, the, on, on the first point. On, on the second point, we, we have a position where we have a number of teachers who don't wish this to be part of their core functions. So we, have, we know that 5% have decided not to do it. So we, would, we have an issue there about if we were considering any possible future approach about whether, whether if, if we were bringing this back within the, the pay structure, whether well, that we would be requiring them to undertake duties they wouldn't be happy to. Then typically you'd have to bring in the, the amount with the salary and that. So we have done that for new entrants. Effectively, we have, we have changed slightly the conditions attaching to the SNS. Uh, nearly all new entrants, higher than 95%, obviously, given that they're starting off a career, they're all opting for SNS. So when we're looking at the new entrant salary, typically, and we have details of that, and I'm sure we can discuss it, uh, we would consider that their starting salary effectively includes the, the, first, the first point on their new scale plus the SNS. For, for, for existing ones, we have had discussions in, in the context of Crow Park about SNS and the agreement that we had was to make the teachers would agree to make themselves more, more available under, under the Crow Park discussions for, for hours. Two points on that. Sorry. So the, the SNS allowance has been moved into core pay for new entrants? Well, eff effectively, it has been, we have extended, it's not technically part of core pay, but we have extended the hours. So rather than 37 hours, new entrants have to do 49 hours to get the SNS rate. And effectively, 
close on 100% of all new entrants go for the go for take the SNS rate, take the SNS payment. Which I think then going back to your previous point, if so many people are willing to do it, almost I mean over 95%, then I think you could fairly say that they understand that it's part of the job, and that if you were negotiating new contracts, I wouldn't be so worried about the 5% or less, because clearly the majority of the workforce accept that this is something that has to be done, and are able to do it and happy to do it. Um, but when we look then at, at the, the provision then for the teachers coming in and this allowance and the extra hours that they have decided to take on. Previously when we looked at this, when the Comptroller and Auditor General looked at it, there was a concern that the 37 hours wasn't being met. So that would assume then that there wasn't a need for the 37 hours. But now we think there's a need for the 49 hours. Well, we, we have, to, we, as during, during the processing of that CNAG review, we reduced significantly the categories under which substitution was made and we, uh, especially the, the official school business at second level and, and we, we reduced that significantly. In fact, initially the government removed the official school business category and then actually put in a few million because schools were finding it very hard to cope and a lot of the school management bodies were indicating that, that there would be difficulties, I think it was in January 2009, with actually, with actually keeping schools open. Um, if we didn't have a small amount of, of substitution available for, for that, but we reduced the categories for so as to ensure that the, that the 37 hours is, ma is maximised at second level. What do you mean you say you reduced the categories? We reduced the categories for which substitution would be payable separately. So we reduced uncertified sick leave uh, in terms of the substitute, whether it was substitutable for, in other words, whether somebody could pay for a substitute to come in. So we made it much tighter on the schools in terms of making bringing in substitutes paid for separately. So therefore, to encourage them to use the 37 hours, they report to us that teachers have undertaken the 37 hours. If there's any funding available for the grant at the end of the year, we offset that against the following year to ensure that they're using. So we have a number of mechanisms to ensure. But the though, the primary level. Yeah. I mean, does anything change there? If there was concern that primary school teachers weren't meeting the full 37 hours in the year, yeah. will ex increase the hours that you're available for, but if they're not being called on to, to fill them. Maybe, uh, will I recap maybe the primary post-primary one for a minute? The 37 hours is, 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 is a uh, second level or a post-primary phenomenon only, in fact, and it was needed at post-primary because you don't have the class teacher occupying the, the, the situation for the full day. Th there's no doubt that the regime of substitution and supervision as it obtained in primary schools was a great deal more satisfactory right back in 2002 than that, uh, that obtained at second level. We have a concept though of the common basic scale and a concept of uh, the, the, the teachers pay at both levels. Teachers have, primary and second level teachers have for many, many decades been remunerated equally. So there was, there was, there was a real issue back in 2000 uh, as, as to whether or not we would seek to apply an allowance uh, only to the second level sector thereby break the common basic scale and probably in perception terms be seen to reward unions who have em had embarked on industrial action uh, and uh, do nothing at the primary level. That was a real tactical issue at the time. And the tactical call uh, of government eventually was the, the, the appropriate thing to do was to maintain the common uh, salary scale and structure for both, for, for both, and in the process probably get a greater certainty in relation to primary, albeit the needs weren't as great there. So I, I mean, I, I would entirely acknowledge your point that when, when, when you know you look at this and you say, well, what is the extra being provided at both levels? There's no question that the extra has a greater tangibility at second level, but those were the factors of the time that, that, that led to that approach. And just then in terms of the, the allowance split, the 118 million, uh, are we talking then about 50 million roughly on primary uh, substitution and then the remaining money goes on, or sorry, supervision, and the remaining goes on substitution and at post-primary level? Is that roughly how it breaks down? Uh, at at post-primary level, the, the, the scheme, the 37 hours is, is applicable to, 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 to both, in fact, and individual schools have their own call and make their own call as to whether the needs 
uh, for supervision are greater than the needs for substitution. So you can have different balances, in fact, within schools. There, there may be schools whose circumstances are such that they don't need a, a lot of yard supervision and so on. So in that's, that type of context, there's a greater amount of the fund available in that school. Uh, for for, uh, substitu for super uh, substitution. I think you want to have that flexibility at the school level. I think it's important. So when we look at the post-primary school and the second level of the school, we're talking about supervision when a uh, colleague is absent, who's going to look after, you know, third year two class, they're put into the library, and then that teacher goes in and sits for that period of time. Thank you, should I just conclude on this then? Uh, and if a teacher signs up to do 37, or it's now, it's been increased from 37 hours, is it? But well, that's only for new entrants. Yeah. Yeah, but an existing teacher, if they agree to do 37 hours of that kind of work extra in the year, they're getting this additional payment. Yeah. And that's not been looked at. When you say it's not been... We're not looking, looking at re-examining that for existing beneficiaries of that allowance. No. no. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair.